I do want to introduce Professor Altschaff. She is from the UMass Department of History, as I mentioned. Her area of specialization is um, Soviet history, and particularly in Central Asia. So we're very happy to have her tonight to talk about um, energy interests and human rights issues in Central Asia and the Caspian Basin. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, and thank all of you for coming. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to um, talk about this topic of human rights and energy security, mostly from the point of view of the United States, but also from the point of view of other industrialized countries, because they're the ones who both need energy, uh, mostly oil and gas, that are produced by the states that I'm examining, and they're also the same ones who, for the most part, produced and uh, articulate their devotion to human rights as we're going to see in this uh, presentation. I'm looking specifically at the, the case of the Caspian Basin. Um, I, I am, as Susan, Suzanne said, an historian, um, but my training is a little bit unconventional. Both my bachelor's and my master's degrees were actually in interdisciplinary areas. Uh, and that meant that I did a certain amount of history but also political science and sociology and some anthropology and economics, and continued that even during doing a PhD in history so that I would understand some of these things. I work in late imperial and Soviet history, but my own research is actually on the Caucasus on Azerbaijan in particular, and a teaching field for me has been Central Asia for quite a number of years. And since the collapse of the Soviet Union, I had an opportunity then to get back into an, an early interest of mine, which is current politics. Uh, and so I like to connect history and historical precedent and evolution of particular problems to current problems. So I work in both areas and I publish in both areas, and that's sort of the context within which this talk comes. I'm also right now teaching a class uh, on human rights and energy concerns, and so this is something that I'm working on right at the moment. There's an inherent tension, I think, for the industrialized world between the need for cheap and plentiful energy and at the same time the commitment to human rights. And that's my overall context that led me to teach this class and that leads me also to work in this area for my own research projects. So oil and gas, as I think we know because we live in an industrialized society, really provide um, not only industrial power, but as a result of that, military and political power and the high standard of living that we enjoy in the United States. Um, this is a global issue. Uh, it's global for the United States and U.S. strategic perspectives uh, in terms of economic political military calculations about projecting U.S. power throughout the world. And it has led the United States in the past and still continues to lead the United States at various times to make friends with tyrants. And the Shah of Iran is one example. Uh, the current government in Saudi Arabia is another one. And there are others in what I consider my part of the world in the Caspian Basin. And at the same time, the political ideology in the United States and in most of Western Europe and other industrialized countries is also about the notion of universal values, specifically the protection, the definition and the protection of the individual and individual human rights. <coughs> and those values are um, communicated by the United States not only as a question of showing American identity, but also showing the kinds of values that the United States claims that it stands for in other parts of the world. If you take a couple of historical examples, the kind of thing I mean here is in the Cold War, for example, if you think just about the very isolated example of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, um, very often, people who are not real familiar with the use of those shortwave radio stations and their broadcasts tend to uh, associate them only with the broadcasts themselves and with putting news out for Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union in the period of Communist Party rule in those particular states. But the radio also had and maintains even now uh, an enormous research arm. And in both the research and in the broadcasting, 
part of the argument, part of the image that the United States has put out about itself is about as the defender of human rights and a particular way of life that ensures individual liberty and democratic society. And it was used in the Cold War as one of the tools to offset arguments about the benefits of socialism and the communist way of life. By the same token, now in the War on Terror, you can look around the, United, uh, around the world and look at US embassies, and you'll discover that almost every embassy, and certainly outside of Europe, but even in Europe as well, have public diplomacy offices. And officers who work in public diplomacy talk all the time uh, to their public audiences in the assigned country about these way of life issues, the US defense of individual liberties and of democratic governments, freedom of speech, assembly, expression, media, etc. So both of these issues are global and they come into conflict on a global scale. And the result of that <coughs> is that there are all kinds of things that I could potentially be talking about this evening and as you listen to me and as you think about how you're going to present this in your own varying classrooms, you'll be way ahead of me in terms of recognizing the kinds of ways you can apply some of these issues for various types of students at various levels. The order of the talk that I'm going to give today is going to be first uh, a quick overview with a lot of maps, which I love very much, of oil and gas producing countries, the pipeline system, and a little bit of the politics around those two things. Second, I'm going to look at human rights, definitions of human rights in terms of international documents, international organizations, and a little bit on the watchdog organizations, the oversight groups. And then finally, uh, ending with one, or if I have time, two cases in which there are particular conflicts in these particular areas and what they're really about and how they actually um, shake out, so to speak. My area is the Caspian Basin. I know everyone does not have a mental map of that area, so I've got one coming up. And the countries that surround it, starting from the north and going clockwise, are Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Azerbaijan. Except for Iran, the other countries were all republics of the USSR until its collapse at the end of 1991. Um, in terms of the, the whole problem of human rights versus uh, energy supplies, I often teach in my classes also transit states that are not themselves producers, but in terms of pipeline transportation come into play. Afghanistan is one of those, and Uzbekistan, which was also a former Soviet Republic, is another one of those. This is a blurry map of the Caspian region and much of the rest of, um, of and the areas that are adjacent to it. So at the top, you can see Russia. Um, and then Kazakhstan, which is one of the largest of now independent formerly Soviet republics. Uzbekistan, which does not have a coastline on the Caspian, it's completely landlocked, but I said it sometimes comes into considerations because it's a transit country for energy uh, and it is one of the most, um, one of the best known uh, and one of the most very violators of human rights of a whole bunch of different kinds and ranks very Is low. Uzbekistan? Uzbekistan, yeah. And ranks very low on those, um, for those organizations that actually give numerical rankings to violations of human rights and, and, and democratic norms. Uh, to the south is uh, Turkmenistan, about which not much is available in English uh, because the regime in Turkmenistan has been so effective at controlling access and controlling information, um, and for that matter, controlling access of its own citizens to medical care, libraries, schooling, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that it's very difficult to find good material on, Uzbek on Turkmenistan. Um, if, you, if you can use Russian or if you um, have students who can use Russian, you have much greater access to information on Turkmenistan, but even still. And of course if you know Turkmen, but not a lot of people do. <laughs> um, Iran was not part of the Soviet Union, uh, Azerbaijan here, which I'll come to, but you can see this neighborhood. 
Uh, next to Iran, of course, is Iraq uh, and Turkey. And if we were to go farther to the west, you'd be on the Mediterranean coast. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit of a distance. Mm -hmm. But just to give you the location of where that is. And then over here we have the Black Sea, Ukraine, uh, and, and back to Russia again. My next map is a lot clearer because it's only the Caspian Basin itself. And so these are actually the countries mostly that I'll be examining. And in this case, you can see the Azerbaijan's neighbors in the Caucasus of Georgia and Armenia, which also both border Turkey. And Armenia also borders Iran, uh, but Georgia does not. The only country in this region, and for that matter, the only country at all, that borders both Russia and Iran is Azerbaijan. And that leads Azerbaijan to be important for reasons that are not of immediate importance in this topic on energy and human rights, but certainly have give it a certain um, strategic importance in terms of the area as a whole and US interests, which I will circle back to at the end, why should the United States care about Azerbaijan? It seems quite isolated. Um, it's pretty far from many other things that the US has interests in. Uh, and, and my particular experience there is not the reason anyone else is interested in it. And, but its location and its oil richness and natural gas is what makes a real difference here. If you are interested, if, if it's 1991 and you are an oil company or you are an oil or natural gas consuming entity, company, country, organization, etc., then the collapse of the Soviet Union and your ability to actually access energy sources in the Caspian region was a huge boon. It was a cause for great celebration at the time. The energy sources here in the Baku area had been well known since the middle of the 19th century. After the discovery of oil in the United States in Pennsylvania, and before the resources of Oklahoma and Texas had really been developed at all, uh, a, an oil rush, for, for lack of a better term, was developed in the Baku area. And foreign investors, the Nobels, the Rothschilds, all sorts of people came rushing in and developed the oil industry in Baku when it was part of the Russian Empire. Because of Russian laws about limits on repatriating foreign investment, this area was not as thoroughly exploited and the Russians didn't lose as much money on it as some other countries lost when foreigners came in and invested in their oil or other energy sources. But what it meant was that this area was really well known. By 1901, the Baku area was actually producing so much oil on an annual basis that it broke the standard oil monopoly uh, of oil sales in Europe. Now you're looking at this area and you say, okay, how did you get that oil to Europe? Initially, the only way to get it out was it was initially put into barrels and then loaded onto ships, which went along the Caspian coast to the mouth of the Volga at Astrakhan, and then up the Volga River, which was not even passable some of the year, connected to the canal system that was in the area of Moscow and St. Petersburg, and transported out to the Baltic, which is a very expensive proposition. And yet, they were able to produce it so cheaply, they could sell the oil for a lower price than oil being produced and refined in the United States. And so that is just an indirect indication of how much they were actually able to produce. Well, Time-wise, when did they find oil? The late 19th century in, in Baku area they or had, mid 19th century? They had known that oil was there since before the Muslim conquest, since before the 9th century, before the 8th century. Wow. There were very early uh, Greek <coughs> geographers who wrote about the different colors of oil in the Baku area in ancient or you know, like what we would consider late antiquity, early medieval time period. Was it periods. just like coming to the surface? It bubbled that? to the surface, and it was being pushed to the surface by all the natural gas underneath. <laughs> and the, it, they would describe this very colorful oil 
and there was green oil and blue oil and white petroleum, which was considered to have important medicinal qualities, mm. and we still use it. Petroleum jelly. Petroleum jelly. It's Vaseline <laughs> petroleum jelly. Vaseline's just the trade name. Yes, exactly. So it was really coveted from very early on, and there are descriptions of early travelers who actually were able to um, participate in scooping this early oil out with buckets loading it into skin, animal skins, and putting it on camelbacks and carrying it in all directions. Um, well, let's see, it's, a, it's almost easier, I guess, to see here. Um, from Baku, you can get along the roads, actually, overland trade, and get down and connect into the trade, overland trade system of Iran, and then go out this way across the traditional trade routes called the Silk Road, or connect to Indian trade routes as well. You can also do overland trade out this way across Anatolia and get to Constantinople slash Istanbul uh, and connect to the Mediterranean and the north-south trade routes there. So this had actually been known since antiquity. But the difference in the 1870s was that um, modern oil exploration began and wells began to be drilled. But the pressure that led the oil to be pushed up to the surface was so great that when they sank wells, they'd get these explosive gushers. And that was unusual, and they really, most of the oil guys had not seen that before. And so they didn't know how to control it, and so these gushers would sometimes go for days, and the oil would run all over the place, and they tried to capture it, and that was really very difficult. And so they ended up, because they couldn't manage it, and they couldn't control it, and they didn't know what to do with all this oil, they would burn it off, because they, they didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't transport it fast enough, they didn't have good storage facilities, so they just burned it off. Anyway, so it was known, but from the 1870s is when this modern industry began, and um, about the 80s is when they actually began to try to figure out what are going to be good ways to transport it, and in the mid-80s they actually built um, a railroad, a railroad link that went from Baku through a pass in the Caucasus Mountains and ended up at Batumi at the Black Sea. And so it could be shipped, in, again, in barrels on the train and then go over and get to the Black Sea and there be loaded onto ships and there it had to go out through the straits at, at Istanbul. It's actually, the, the Nobels actually are the first one to fund the, the, the construction of the first real oil tankers where this oil, instead of being put on barrels first, was actually loaded into the hull of the ship and rested against the hull of the ship. But it was only single hull construction. Yeah. So as soon as it hit something, <coughs> you would have these oil spills. But the ships weren't that big, so it wasn't as big a catastrophe as the Exxon Valdez or something, you know, on, in, on, on that order of magnitude. <laughs> but it took a while for them to get around to double hull construction and then all of the other things in a modern tanker where you can compartmentalize and turn things off and so on. Oil pipelines actually began to be built also by Europeans, <clears throat> but they went, they just ran parallel to the, um, to the railroad. The real thing was in this area, the oil was largely exhausted by the time you got even just to the Russian Revolution, to World War I. Uh, production dropped off quite a bit, and the Revolution and World War I and then the Civil War and Soviet takeover and all of these things really led to diminished production. In spite of that, this Baku was still one of the points that Hitler was striving to reach in World War II in order to get the necessary oil and gas supplies that he needed for the Wehrmacht. No Wehrmacht can run without having, you know, internal combustion engines, they're not like horses. Uh, you, you need oil, you can't just live off the, the fat of the land, so to speak. Um, after World War II, though, the Soviets really stopped investing. They went and looked for oil elsewhere, and they invested much less in the infrastructure. Other oil was offshore, both for Baku and up in this part of the Caspian as well, off the Kazakhstan coast and off the coast of Turkmenistan. But 
the Soviets did not really develop offshore drilling and exploration. They traded or, frankly, stole it from the United States or other <laughs> countries. The Soviet embassy in the United States was enormous and had an enormous research and commercial section because a lot of the work that they did was copying and getting American technology that was readily available in technical journals. So, in spite of that, they, they only actually copied very little. They put a lot more effort into Arctic drilling. That's not my problem at the moment. So once the Soviet Union collapsed and foreign companies were able to come in here, those guys with their Pennzoil caps beat the diplomats into Baku. And the oil companies came in, developed offshore drilling. They did the same for Kazakhstan. They didn't in Turkmenistan because they weren't allowed in. And if you could, I, I'm not sure how well you can see this in this light, but what this pipeline system is showing you, so here's Baku, all these green lines, this, oh, I thought this was going to be a screen. Um, <laughs> well, all of those lines are actually the Russian, um, the Russian pipeline system. Oh, okay. And they're meant to bring, yeah, you can see this green one that goes across up and here. And this other one comes across from Kazakhstan and ends up in Novorossiysk. Again, these all get into, um, they connect to um, the city of Novorossiysk, which meant loading the oil onto Soviet tankers and getting through the straits. And as tankers got larger and the oil supply got greater and the, the, the transit became heavier and heavier traffic, the, the Turkish government became more and more fearful of an oil spill in the Straits or along the historically important coast of Istanbul and, um, and the Black Sea side and the whole Straits and then out through the Dardanelles, etc. And so they've been trying to diminish the, um, uh, the traffic through the Straits. So in the post-Soviet period, there have been a couple of things that have been going on. One of them is that the Russians, post-Soviet Russian governments, have been less than welcoming toward all of the Western investors. US, British, BP is very big in Baku. Other European companies, the Japanese companies, some Chinese companies, Chinese state oil, which cares more about Kazakhstan than Azerbaijan. Uh, all of these, the, the, the Russian see these as ways of exerting their political influence in this area. And so they're very concerned about this. At the same time, the Azerbaijanis and the Kazakhs in particular really want to exercise their independence and not be stuck into the Russian pipeline system and, and deal directly with Western companies. So how do you do that when all of your pipelines run north? There are a couple of possibilities. The possibility that the oil companies liked the best was, the one thing they liked the best was the idea of an oil swap. An oil swap meant you take it out of the ground in Baku, or you take it out of the ground here, out of, out of the water actually, from the, the Kashgan oil fields of Kazakhstan or those off the coast of Baku. You put them in tankers and you deliver them to the Iranian port where am I? To the Iranian port of Enzeli to go into the Iranian pipeline system. And then you take out down at the Persian Gulf an equal amount of Iranian oil. And this seemed like, economically speaking, the best arrangement from the point of view of the oil companies who were looking at this as an economic calculation. But the U.S. government said, no, no way, you are not putting this oil. You're not doing anything to benefit Iran. You will not deal with, it, with Iran at all. You will get no loans if you attempt to do this. You will get no subsidies. You will get, um, your assets may be frozen. You will not get any benefits. From, and the U.S. government will block everything else that you try to do. So the companies saw the, uh, the wisdom of this argument so to speak, and went along with an idea that the Azerbaijanis and the Turks came up with to build a new pipeline that went, and you see the dotted line here, from Baku, following the old 
pathway up to Tbilisi in Georgia and then across the border into Turkey, cutting all the way across Turkey and ending up way down here at the Turkish port of Jehan. The C in Turkish is a J. Um, this port of Jehan, and you can see the little green line that connects to the Turkish oil pipeline system, which comes out of Iraq and connects to Iraqi oil. And so this was actually a usable terminus already. And many people said, never happened. This was called the BTC pipeline. Never happened, it's a political pipeline. It's too expensive, it's too long. Um, it, it avoids Russia, which is fine with most of us, um, because Azerbaijan and Armenia have been more or less at war since about 1988. Um, complicated other related topic here. It, it avoids them, it avoids Iran, uh, it avoids the Russians. So this looks cool, let's do it. The U.S. put a lot of money into it, the Turkish government put a lot of money into it, and lo and behold, uh, it came to pass. And so the BTC is an existing pipeline, um, which is indicated here. This gives you a little more of the zone. It also shows you where the Persian Gulf is. And it exists, and they're working on connecting Kazakh oil under sea to the pipeline at Baku. And they're trying to figure out a way to connect Turkmen uh, oil, and then a parallel pipeline for natural gas from Azerbaijan, from Turkmenistan, etc. Now, these countries are important oil producers. Most of their oil does not go to the United States, although the U.S. has been interested in Caspian oil as a way to get away from too much dependence on Persian Gulf and Saudi oil. But Europe is a major consumer of the oil that comes both from Russia and from the Caspian <coughs> Basin. And so for all of them, that is a really crucial component. They need the oil, they need the natural gas, there are constant ongoing discussions about more pipelines, more sales, prices, etc. And then we run into human rights. These are not countries that score well on human rights indicators by any of the organizations, United Nations, or NGOs, or whatever. And this leads me to human rights. Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who, although many of you probably don't remember her personally, <laughs> hopefully recognize her, uh, and the cover of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then this, um, reference to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen from the period of the French Revolution, which is clearly one of the inspirations for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as is the United States Declaration of Independence. The, this seems like probably an abrupt shift, but think of it as sort of a parallel um, topic here. Um, and I'm going to end up going through this part a little more quickly because I didn't realize you're going to be that interested in oil or that I was going to talk so much about oil. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was first promulgated in 1948, just after the founding of the United Nations, and under the influence of Eleanor Roosevelt and other uh, Westerners who were really committed in the aftermath of World War II and all of the incredible horrors that it revealed to a real statement of the commitment to human rights. And what might seem, if you look at, say, the Declaration of Independence, what might seem like a very detailed articulation of what those rights are and why they matter. Um, this, in a, because it was a declaration, it didn't have the force of law, but it was laid out as a kind of ideal. And as I said at the beginning, I'm now teaching uh, a capstone senior seminar uh, for undergrads on uh, this very topic, human rights and uh, energy security. And one of the things that we're going over now at the beginning of our semester is these documents and the language in some of these documents. And we had a really interesting discussion uh, in class today as people began by saying what they thought human rights encompassed and what they are uh, before they started reading these documents and things that they found in these documents that were not what they expected and that in one way or other surprised them. 
And it was rather interesting to me to see things that they read into the language of the documents and things that they found surprising that were omitted and actually thought were ignored, whereas they actually weren't when you went back and looked at the documents. So the difference between what people are expecting and um, what they see when they've actually got the document in front of them, to me, seemed like a very interesting, surprising um, component of, of this study. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, was later on coupled with a couple of other documents, this International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which reasserts a number of the same basic rights of liberty and property and freedom of assembly and so on. We'll look at those in a second. And also a covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And the extension of these rights to individuals and the calling upon governments to guarantee them and to educate their citizens in their meaning. And these together uh, were adopted as international law in 1976. And the force that that has is that individuals can, if they can't get a redress of their grievances domestically within their own country, can petition the United Nations and one of the oversight committees, and there are several committees that are targeted for particular kinds of violations, and they can actually take their case without having any legal representation, just as private citizens can take their complaint to one of these UN committees. And they are then, so they are then um, the possibility exists that they will then go to the government in question and say, well, you need to answer for this. Now, how often this has happened, I haven't had a chance to check into how often this has happened, but this would be a great project for a high school class. Is this um, the law under which the federal court in Springfield is doing? Is it the gay rights in Nigeria or one of the other? Oh, I don't it know. Uganda? There is, a, there is a case in the Springfield courts that's an international human rights case brought by um, representatives for people in one of those two countries, I can't remember which, because one of my kids, we had a global relations course, which is like a current events course, yeah. came up with this when they were looking at, they were covering some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and they were floored as to why it was being tried, you know, in fact, it was in Springfield, yeah. but it was a federal court, and it was through the international human rights, I believe. Well, that, that is very likely, because this certainly gives grounds for that. I'm surprised it's in Springfield, even though it's a federal court. Yeah, I was too, but, but I was mm. wondering why, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't know how the jurisdiction Because they were saying it was, it, be it was international, and it was human happened. rights, and you know, it was just one of the many pieces that they were trying to pull together. Right? Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't know that existed. I didn't either, so I was like, oh, neither did they. <laughs> maybe, there's a, maybe there's a project there. Um, the, I have a couple slides here on the verbiage of the preamble to the Declaration of Human Rights. And I bolded uh, a couple of phrases that I thought people might find either very familiar, the reference to inalienable rights, for example, and other things that I thought were particularly, that I found really generate discussion in classes, or that somehow seemed really noteworthy, and that were worth trying to get my students to try to define and to look at what their assumptions were as they made these definitions. So just to look over those, um, just to look at the highlights, um, inalienable rights, uh, of course I cheated and put a little Declaration of Independence down there in case people couldn't guess. Um, the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, that this is one of the first justifications, again coming right out of World War II. Um, the idea that disregard and contempt for human rights had already created these barbarous acts and that these outraged the conscience of mankind. And I found that to be very powerful language that rather than seek a legal basis or a historical basis, this notion of something that was so intrinsically 
significant to human beings, was an outrage to their conscious, conscience, consciousness, was, to me, seemed like a very interesting way of grounding this kind of an, an argument. Um, freedom of speech and belief, and freedom from fear and want, has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. This struck me more now in 2014, and, or last year, even 2013, than it might have if I looked at it 10 years earlier. Because recent opinion polls in post-Soviet countries reflect the preference that a large number of people have for economic security over political freedom. And the assertion that, in fact, it's these types of freedoms that are the highest goal for the common person might not be upheld if you looked really closely at post-Soviet states that remember unfreedom and that actually live with a lot of political unfreedom now. So I haven't really brought that up in my class yet, but I think we're going to look at a couple countries before I ask them to talk about that. Um, if individuals are not to rebel, then these rights must be protected by the rule of law. And the rule of law then turns out to be a whole separate topic, which I love to stress. And it's really easy to stress the rule of law when you deal with a place like Russia or the Soviet Union, because there isn't rule of law in those systems. And so to be able to talk about that and how that functions is a big opportunity, anyway, for me in teaching. And this plays easily into that. And finally, the idea of the dignity and worth of the individual, the equal rights of men and women, social progress, better standards of living, begins to touch on some of the economic issues, but does not articulate specifically where that is in priority to some of these other things. And so as a result of all of this, we therefore promulgate this declaration and promote respect for rights and freedoms and universal and states are meant to promote not only the recognition, but that these rights should be observed in those states. So this is pretty assertive and pretty bold for 1948. And the questions that I like to bring people back to are things like how universal or why is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights claiming to be universal? Are these actually universally held values? Are their origins really universal? Could we find them in different cultures around the globe? Or is this meant to be an, a universality of application? We're asserting that these things are applicable to all human beings. And it doesn't take, at least my students, uh, it doesn't take them very long. They got, they got immediately to this understanding that this was an assertion of applicability to human rights. And I, as a historian, then wanted to get down to these other questions. So where does this notion of human rights come from? Where does this idea of inalienable right come from? We think right away of the Enlightenment of the 18th century. But it's been my contention, as I've worked off and on over this deeper question over the years, that a society needs to value the individual before it gets to the notion of rights. And I feel like my work on this is just really incomplete. And I would love to have a team of students at some level or other, preferably with facility in a couple of different languages, one of which would need to be French, two and Latin maybe, and a couple of others, to really go back into earlier and earlier history and to do this globally in a comparative way, where else do we see, in terms of global philosophical thinking, where do we see value of human beings individually as opposed to the importance of the collective, of the community? And of course, if you go back to early enough societies, you'll see cases where the continued existence of the community is so important and sometimes so fragile that you can't afford to allow individuals to have a great deal of latitude because it could be disastrous to the community as a whole. And so this 
this philosophical problem of the benefit of the one versus the benefit of the many is one that gets reincarnated in all kinds of different ways. Why do we not allow smoking anymore indoors? For the, because the collective benefit of the, the, the multitudes to be free from secondhand smoke has been deemed to outweigh the right of the individual to smoke. Trivial example, unless you're a smoker, I suppose. But it's a tension that we see going back and forth in these kinds of issues, but also in other kinds of issues. Public opinion poll 1997, um, I believe this was a poll taken in the United States, although it was from a Americans in the Globe website, but I couldn't quite, I was unable to find, as, as I looked through what I was unable to find where this poll was actually taken. Do you believe that every person has basic rights, et cetera, et cetera, or do they come from the government? Now you'll notice here 76% of the people who responded said, oh no, these are basic rights, they're intrinsic, to, they're inalienable, they're by virtue of our being human beings, it doesn't have to do with the government, et cetera. I do not find that comforting, frankly, <laughs> that only 76% of Americans <laughs> said this because 17% said rights are given by the government. Once upon a time, back in the 1980s, when I was in the Soviet Union, I had a research assistant, and we were talking about vocabulary things and words for this and words for that, and somewhere along the line in the course of this, he said, oh, oh yes, a constitution. That's where you know what rights the government gives you. <laughs> and I thought, whoa. Whoa, yeah, okay, do I, do I pick this fight or do I just wait till there's another fight that's <laughs> worth really picking? And 7% don't know? Oh my gosh. So <laughs> this, this is a real reality check, I think, for we who may be inclined to assume that everybody's on board with this. Um, stemming from these documents, stemming from this pretty widely held and, and, you know, 76% well-known belief in, in the inalienability of human rights, uh, you've got these various organizations. The UN uh, has a couple, has quite a few, uh, and then uh, the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, fairly popular, well-known, I think, logo, the, the barbed wire around the candle. And the UN, uh, UN groups, there are several, many, and there are a couple of different types. Uh, the UN High Commission for Human Rights is one of the overarching standing bodies. The Human Rights Council is called a charter-based. In other words, it's rooted in the UN Charter. The Human Rights Committee and the Committee Against Torture are treaty-based. In other words, they have to do with particular treaties that are targeted for those issues and they are not standing bodies. They meet a couple of times a year, three-ish for the most part, times a year, fairly long meetings to review um, how countries that are signatories to this particular treaty are doing in terms of observing human rights. And um, this one, the Human Rights Committee, I thought, I need to try to get on that. They meet once a year in New York, but twice a year in Geneva. And that could be, I think, a real contribution to the advancement of human rights, we do those <laughs> meetings in Geneva. And, so the, this, and, and these are actually specialists, not human rights, not uh, UN staff. And they judge on the basis of reports and so on. So, and then they make reports, which if you look at any of these websites, you'll find uh, at least the most recent reports, and in some cases, many reports going back lots of years. The independent NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, Amnesty International was one of the earliest ones to be founded, and initially its focus was on terror, uh, I'm sorry, on torture, and the elimination of torture. And then subsequently it expanded its purview in order to um, to look at larger complexes of human rights violations. Um, again, using as sort of its jumping off point, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human Rights Watch is, um, was started out as the Helsinki Watch, 
you may remember, I'm looking around, yeah, because I remember, so some of you may remember, uh, when the Helsinki Accords were signed in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and the Helsinki Commission and the Helsinki Watch Groups um, came out of this, uh, individual countries, when they became signatories to the Helsinki Accords, pledging human rights and, and uh, a certain level of democratization in their countries. These groups began, began trying to oversee uh, the compliance of their own governments, and there were plenty of these in the Soviet Union, and most of the people who belonged to them ended up in jail sometime or other. But their public stance, their public protests, got enough media attention that it really did bring a lot of embarrassing publicity to the Soviet Union, and does seem to have made a difference in some cases, uh, of, of you know particular um, cases. So out of that came Human Rights Watch, which looks at lots of countries, lots of different types of human rights violations. And the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, um, also came out of the Helsinki Accords. Freedom House, um, I, I had to throw in Freedom House. They look only partly at human rights. They look much more at political democratization. But I had to throw it in because I serve on their review board. And um, we do the same thing. We have, you know, people write reports. Um, the review board gets together once a year in a windowless room in New York City. So it's really not any fun, which is coming up um, in a couple of weeks. And we look at the country reports. We try to cross-check what the country report, what the author of the report says. And then we give it a numerical value. And it goes from one for terrific places, the Scandinavian countries, et cetera, would, would be one. Our program, Nations in Transit, is only former communist countries. So we don't deal with the Scandinavian countries. But the best ranking usually goes to um, Estonia and other Baltic republics, down to seven. And seven, there's a certain comfort. All my countries are down in the sixes, fives and sixes. <laughs> there's a certain comfort knowing Turkmenistan will always be at the bottom. Uh, except a couple of years ago, Uzbekistan joined it at the bottom. Uh, but other countries, Azerbaijan is moving closer and closer. Russia's getting to be worse and worse. And I fully anticipate that they will both be downgraded when we have our next meeting in February. The, the results won't be out until June. Uh, and they also don't care. <laughs> the Hungarians, the Czechs, the Poles, if you downgrade them a quarter point, they'll be on the phone to the Budapest office of Freedom House. Azerbaijan, like, oh, just pump some more oil, deliver the caviar, we'll have another reception. We don't care what you people think. And they don't. They really don't. It's a lovely country, terrible government. Yeah. On the um, Human Rights Committee, the treaty-based UN committees, are they treaty-based that you're a signatory to that treaty and you have to follow kind of like the some of the other treaties? In theory. In theory? In theory, but you're they, supposed to not be torturing people. So in theory, they're supposed to be, they've signed all the treaty, all the UN members have signed these treaties. Whether or not they do it is a whole other issue. That's yeah. true, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the idea. You, you know, you already agreed. You bought in. Bam. Whether they follow the treaty, they're yeah. probably sticking in a box under the bed somewhere. Well, I mean, I do have to, in, in this context, I have to point out, Amnesty International writes scathing criticisms of the United States every year because we still maintain capital punishment. Mm -hmm. And that's considered inhumane mm -hmm. within this framework. And so it's not like there's not finger pointing and plenty of blame to go around and not like we're not at the <laughs> receiving end of some of it. Um, so. And the case that I was going to talk about, um, the first case I was going to talk about was, and this totally played into my course planning, like I thought of this, um, the Olympics in Sochi. Uh, this is just such a super example. And I just wanted to put in here Article 19 of the full body of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions, um, without interference, and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. And here's a guy demonstrating for gay rights, not the rainbow mm -hmm. Olympic rings, being hustled off by Russian security personnel uh, because in reality this is not being allowed 
uh, and the, the, the Russians did, as a result of IOC complaints, International Olympic Committee complaints, did create a zone for demonstrations and complaints. And it is conveniently located 15 kilometers away from the Olympic Village. So if you want to hike out eight miles, seven and a half, eight miles, you can protest anything you want at these Olympics. Plus, didn't Putin make a statement the other day saying something about, you can do whatever you want in your private life, just don't touch our children. I guess he thinks all gays are pedophiles. And that, those are linked. Those are almost always linked in Putin's um, statements. Yeah. And so that's their, this is their defending, you know, the purity of their children. It reminds me, no, it doesn't really. Yes. Uh, originally it was human rights and energy security. Would you, uh, and you seem to have migrated somewhere else. I did. Would you talk about uh, the security arrangements for the Super Bowl? Do you know them? <laughs> You cannot park around the stadium. You're going to be busted in a major transport. You're going to go through TSA security regulations. Hmm. So what's yeah. the difference? When we have a political rally, there are buffer zones. Mm -hmm. And the police don't give a damn. They'll rip signs away from you. So I mm -hmm. personally don't see a difference. And I wish you'd get back to the energy security, why the US will support uh, dictators, and things like that. So, yeah. Um, well, this is my list of the various things that are going on with respect to the Olympic situation. And the responses, because since Russia is an energy producing state and because, as I said, back on the map period, Europe is a major consumer of Russian energy. When you look at the U.S., but more germane in this instance, the EU responses to, and, and IOC responses, to this particular, not just the one thing, but the series of things in Russia, which are identified as human rights violations, that they have not been responsive to supporting these reports of the abuses. And the Europeans, in fact, have said they would refuse to attend but it's the Europeans who are so dependent on Russian energy that have been particularly unwilling, it appears, to protest against not only the human rights violations here for the Olympics, but also in terms of Russia's own policies. So if we just back up for, oops, back up for a second, um, things like uh, this, this village of Achstucker, is in the mountains between the Olympic Village and the, um, the ski area. And in order to build the Olympic Village, uh, it was, roads were built that cut it off from major roads. And it has been without access to major roads for three years. And its water supply has been also reduced and at times cut off, so water is trucked in. Um, migrant workers were used over the past several years to build the Olympic Village. They're migrants um, from former Soviet republics, and the Russians took their passports so they couldn't go anywhere, and then housed them in barracks so that they would build the Olympic Village, and they were working 12 and more hours per day in order to do that. This particular complaint, Human Rights Watch had gone to the uh, IOC with it, and they have accepted the Russian repeating, r r the Russian excuse to say, we're working on it, we're going to fix it, we have fixed it, they go back, it's not actually fixed. But neither the IOC nor the EU has pressed anything around those particular, um, that particular case. Um, As a sort of preemptive measure, the Russian police have been visiting or calling uh, people who were established as protesters and their attorneys going to their houses uh, or calling them and suggesting that they should come and visit the police station and talk over what their concerns may be around um, protests and so on in respect to the Olympics. and. These people have all, the reports that I've said, has said that they have all said, well, do you have 
an order? Do you have a warrant? Do you have something to compel me to come down to the police station? And in all of the cases that were reported, that was not one of the situations, and so they all refused to go. But this is considered, these people are complaining that this is a matter of harassment. The question of combating terrorist threats, I think, is one of the most complicated, and it's a little bit more recent also. Um, the, the problem of terror threats has really come up a little bit more in the last several days. And the idea of the, the black widows, the terrorists, et cetera, from the Caucasus areas, from Dagestan, the other groups. Um, and these are being reported in various media, CNN, NBC, etc., as being um, dangerous threats that are going to require much tighter security, um, minus the Black Widow is probably comparable to what we're going to see at Super Bowl security and other kinds of public security in every country in the world because we're all so worried about terrorism. Um, and I think what makes it complicated is it's a threat and is it the same level of threat as warrants the response that it's getting? And that's a question to which I don't have an answer. And I think it'd be very difficult to find the detail that would allow you to have an answer for t to that. Um, the other case, let's see, where am I going here? Oh, OK. Um, Russia as a whole, I mean, I happen to pick on the Olympics because it's about to take place and because it's so much in the news and it allowed my English-speaking students to be able to access the information. But this comes from an article um, by Thomas Friedman, who was a foreign, let's see, he was a chief of the foreign desk for the New York Times in the Middle East, and he's worked in, a, in several other areas. And he put together an article on democracy versus oil. And he used the Freedom House electoral process scores, which are mapped on this side, versus the price of oil mapped on this side across a series of years from 1998 to 2005. And the punchline here, and he does this with five other countries as well, not only former Soviet countries, but also Latin America, Africa, and so on. And using assorted major events, he shows that the, as the price of oil goes up, which is what the white stripe is for, that these measurements of democracy, which, ha which have to do um, with things like this arrest, which can also be classified as a human rights issue as, as well as uh, a democratization issue, that these various violations of what are considered democratic norms within the international community and human rights have gone down, 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 as indicated by the worsening score in the Freedom House situation. And in this instance, he's looking at oil going from a mere 12 or so dollars a barrel up to only $50 a barrel. Now, it's been a long time since we've seen $50 a barrel for oil. And in the, uh, I'll come back to that, oh, I guess. Oh, okay, the Azerbaijan case um, was really, I, I threw this slide in here because I gave a talk a couple of years ago. Uh, oil was actually close to $130 a barrel. And Azerbaijan was having the worst imaginable elections, violating, you know, throwing reporters in jail for all kinds of things. But oil was at $130 a barrel. Well, by the time I started the presentation and the time I actually gave the presentation, it was down to $100 a barrel. And then after that, I gave it again, it was down to $70 a barrel. But oil prices have stayed really very high in the meantime. And so there's, there are other components, I think, in here. One of those is that Azerbaijan, as an example, actively courts, diplomats, gives receptions, throws lavish parties, caviar up to the eyeballs. It has become called caviar diplomacy that in the case of Azerbaijan, they're basically uh, sort of appeasing people uh, with these lavish receptions. And surprisingly, f groups that formerly had complained about human rights and democracy violations in Azerbaijan have not only stopped, 
but in the last election, presidential election of 2013, this last October, they actually said, oh no, we find that the this election met international standards and norms, and this was a perfectly fair election. Um, so this, let's see, we go back a little bit to Ilham, and, and this is Ilham Aliyev, he's the current and possibly permanent president of Azerbaijan. Uh, right after his last re-election, uh, term limitations were ended. Uh, by a, a, a parliamentary body that his party controls overwhelmingly. And, um, and yet, uh, because of, people will say, caviar diplomacy. Um, final, final point, uh, I don't believe that, that the U.S. complains about Russia because specifically of oil. It's because Russia, as the heir to Soviet policies and the Soviet-American relationship, and Russia sort of now takes that position, is in fact an adversary to the United States for reasons that don't actually have to do with the U.S. getting energy from the Soviet Union, uh, from, sorry, from Russia. Um, and the Magnitsky Bill, which was passed as a bipartisan member, uh, by, uh, as a bipartisan measure in Congress during November and December of 2012, um, is being expanded. Uh, it uh, bans visas for Soviet officials that are associated with human rights violations and uh, prevents them from having access to the U.S. banking system. The argument is that no one cares that this, this is unimportant. Other people have said what it takes away is access to education. And it takes away access to education, higher education in the U.S. for their children. And the idea is that that's um, that's part of the power of the, of the thing. And there is now a bipartisan effort to expand this bill to other countries as well, so that diplomats who are involved, who would normally have easy access, easy visa access to the United States, but are involved in human rights violations, that they will also be barred from coming into the U.S. And there's a push to try to get the European countries to do this, but the European countries, as I said, because they get oil and gas from the Russians, have been not nearly as eager as the U.S. to follow up on this. What countries are they wanting to expand that to? They're not looking at the Arab countries. Are they looking at former Soviet countries that are oil producers? They are, and I believe they may be considering China as well, although I'm not absolutely certain about that. This is really in the discussion phase, so I'm not completely sure what they're planning to do. So I ran over six minutes, and I am sorry for that, but I'm happy to let you ask more questions, comments, etc., in a group as a whole. Yes? Uh, you brought up uh, Thomas Friedman. I have a quote here. I wish you'd comment on it. Uh, Thomas Friedman wrote, the hidden hand of the market will never work without the hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonald Douglas, the builder of the F-15, and the hidden fist that keeps the world safe for Silicon Valley technology is called the United States Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps. That's a very rich bunch of ideas by, by Friedman, and, and I don't think he's wrong. I don't think he's wrong. On the other hand, the relationships are more complicated. When the Soviet Union first collapsed, the post-Soviet leaders of these various countries were confident that that was true in a very direct relationship, that where U.S. commercial interests would be threatened, the U.S. military would certainly be deployed to protect them. And they were astonished to discover that it actually didn't work that way every single time and that the United States would not, for example, come into Azerbaijan to defend Azerbaijan as a way of defending oil investments in Azerbaijani oil. And so more things go into the calculation on U.S. decision about projecting its power, deploying its troops, than merely commercial interests. That said, I go back to my first point that I don't think Friedman is incorrect about that and that ultimately those things are really partners. But the way it plays out in given situations also takes other things into account. And so it's, 
true but not simple. Um, yes, Michelle. Have there been examples where human rights have trumped um, corporate interests? I don't know about the Caspian Basin or in general. <laughs> okay. Where he, the question is, are there, can I come up with a case where human rights interests have trumped corporate interests? I wish I had an answer <laughs> that in the affirmative <laughs> for that. And really, I, I mean, Azerbaijan's the place I know the best, and I really cannot think of a case in which that has been true. I, on the upside, I can certainly think of a case Okay, maybe I shouldn't say this, I'm saying it anyway. I've watched a series of U.S. ambassadors serve in Azerbaijan, and the difference in how much they care about economic issues versus how much they care about human rights issues and democracy is vast. It is not, it does not match with policy statements that come out of the White House. I can, I can name <laughs> Uh, one former ambassador who, as soon as he left his post as ambassador of the United States to Azerbaijan, retired from the Foreign Service and took a lucrative job with an oil company. Mm -hmm. And the last time, well, okay, not the last time I was in Baku, but, but I was in Baku a couple of years later, and I was at a Fourth of July reception that the United States Embassy always gives, and it was in a big, fancy Marriott or some lavish hotel that now exists in Baku that didn't exist when I first went there around the pool and there were bands and people were playing and I look across the pool and who's there but the former ambassador who now works for some oil company and I don't think even a US oil company. <laughs> and meanwhile who's going to the podium but the current US ambassador who had private tutoring in Azerbaijani not only got up and talked about the importance of democratic values but visited the homes of reporters who were actually in jail already for having done things they weren't supposed to do, covered stories they weren't supposed to cover, insulting the honor of the president, which is a law on the books in Azerbaijan. And she actually visited their homes and made that high a profile uh, to these kinds of issues. So. The more you dig, the more you look at individual cases, the more, more you're going to see that the person who's the ambassador or the person who's the DCM, the deputy chief of mission, can make all the difference in terms of how U.S. policy is actually carried out in a country in a particular time period. And what, you know, what their relationship is also with the oil companies varies as well. Some of them know, okay, good times, we know this guy. Uh, or, okay, let's lay low because we know this other person is so going to be one of those goody two-shoes human rights people. So when she was the ambassador, human rights were upheld more often than... They were not upheld any better than they were before <laughs> or after, but there was this spotlight on the abuses. Because when the American ambassador gets out of her car and goes up to somebody's little hovel of an apartment, um, they're nice on the inside, they just look bad on the outside. Um, that's news. Mm -hmm. and, and that's reported, uh, not on TV, which is totally controlled by the government and the ruling party, but reported in other newspapers and will be reported on uh, radios, like Radio Liberty does reporting um, from there. And it makes it a lot harder for other people to ignore it because she's shining that spotlight on it. And then she went on to be ambassador in, I think, Estonia, which How has fewer problems. How often does the ambassador change, and who is the like? We should know. We should know who our ambassadors, but nobody knows who our ambassadors except the big name ones, like Caroline Kennedy. Um, Schlossberg is the Japan, 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 Japanese ambassador, but. Uh, the ambassador's term, like most Foreign Service officers, is two years, but they can ask for a third year extension. And our, the current U.S. ambassador is Richard Morningstar, who was very well known in terms of um, international uh, strategic uh, weapons, negotiations, UN kinds of things. 
and has, to my knowledge, not said one peep about human mm -hmm. rights issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is he part of the Morning Star publishing family? Oh, I don't know. Is that what I, you said Morning Star, I thought of one of the big newspaper publishers. Yeah, I don't know if he is. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's, an unusual. it's an unusual name, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes, ma'am. Who do the ambassadors take direction from? Who do the ambassadors take direction from? Ambassadors get their instructions from the State Department, which in theory gets its orders from the President of the United States. And it is very... That said, however, um, <laughs> the... Um, the Secretary of State is really the moderator, so the Secretary of State will deal with all kinds of normal, routine <coughs> kinds of things and what's going to happen here and there, and, and she, or now he, is, you know, the, the person who oversees all these things. But if there's something serious, if there's a collision, conflict of interests, emergency, whatever, then, yeah, it's going to be the President. But the President, the Secretary of State, most of the people in the diplomatic area, in the intelligence community, are functioning on the basis of mountains of reports that filter up to them through all kinds of conduits, many of which are very narrow at any given time. And so until they ask about a problem, they may not get information about a problem, and by then it may already be a well-developed problem. And so an ambassador has at her or his disposal the whole staff of the embassy, which is supposed to be monitoring what happens locally. And most of those people also change every two or three years. But any diplomat will tell you, someone who doesn't change every two or three years, who's really there for a prolonged period of time, may not in fact work for the State Department. <laughs> Uh, when I was in graduate school in public policy, um, one of the things that, that I heard was that um, U.S. foreign policy is largely determined by, maybe it's a few hundred people, maybe it's a, a small number of thousands of people, um, people at places like the Brookings Institution and um, recently the Heritage Foundation and so forth. Um, to what extent is that true, and I'm assuming that those people don't necessarily include the people at Shell Oil or, or um, Exxon, um, although there's clearly you know, money going into think tanks from those places and there's influence, but the U.S. foreign policy is really largely set by a very small number of people. Um, who are those people? Yeah, who are those people anyway? They're all mysterious people. There's, there's cross-fertilization between the government, the think tanks, and private corporations. It's much more common between the government and the think tanks. And there are big think tanks like the Rand Corporation, where people who work out in the field, uh, sometimes for the State Department, sometimes for the intelligence community, will get a kind of sabbatical for analysis, work in RAND for a year, two years, produce position papers, white papers, that kind of thing, and then go back out into whatever their field work was. And they tend to be listened to and they tend to have a lot of influence. There are also certain people in other kinds of think tanks that for one reason or other, and there might be a dozen different reasons why you know, you get listened to and I don't get listened to, and it may have to do with connections, it may be who you went to school with, it may be where you last served, it may be a connection in some earlier employment, and those are the people that they, the, the regular go-to people. And they talk about them as if they know everything, but if you really look at what they're writing, sometimes they do and sometimes they really don't. And the, the narrowness of the conduits for general reports to go through to supervisors and the necessary summarizing that happens with these reports really shrinks a report that's, that's going up the line that's available to somebody who is more directly influential to policy. But the number of people who really have an, a, a, an opportunity to influence real policy making is really tiny because it's a tiny circle and access to it is really tightly controlled. And there were a couple of issues right at the beginning of the post-Soviet era that 
I tried really, really hard, and a couple of other people tried really, really hard to make a dent in thinking at the policy level on a couple of issues. When the Soviet Union collapsed, they knew everything that was going on in the Kremlin. They knew the breakfast menu in the Kremlin. But they could not find Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, etc., on a map. They had no idea where these places were. So those of us in the academic community who were specialists in these areas, who had lived there, who knew the languages, etc., we got called regularly to come and participate in different kinds of conferences, roundtables, brainstorming sessions, etc. And you could see there that the sub policy level of analysts were smart, they were alert to all these different things, they thought critically, they took nothing for granted, and then you looked a couple steps up at the policy and the same garbage came out month after month, year after year, to try to penetrate that wall was just awful. I mean awful. And three or four years after the Soviet Union collapsed, I finally began to hear people talking about some of the points that I and my colleagues had been trying to make in 1992. And by 1995, they were beginning to be discussed, and they were treated as if, oh, we always thought that. Oh, yeah, that's so obvious, blah, blah, blah. And so you really felt like you were just cracking your head against the wall sometimes. But yes, I have no doubt the policy is made by a small number of people. Who they are, that's harder to tell. They probably come from five or six different universities. Mm -hmm. Sir Alta, thank you very much. You're very